I am going to invite up our guest preacher today. And I'm going to do a quick introduction because at this service, this face is a little more recognizable. At the other two, it wasn't. This is Jordan. Now, a little bit about Jordan. I met Jordan spring of 2017 at Clarkson University because they were doing an outreach event and I wanted to join it and see what it was like. Um, and I remember Jordan telling me he had to leave to do an online Bible study. I later learned that Jordan has done and led many Bible studies. Jordan has an incredible passion for scripture. Last May, he graduated from Clarkson. This past fall, he came to RPI to start his graduate work. Shortly after coming to RPI, he came here and just, you know, like most grad students who have all this free time, he decided, why not? Let's join the worship band. So you probably have seen him up here either behind Glenn supporting Glenn or when Glenn's not here leading the worship band. Things that I know, also on campus, he's been leading a discipleship group for men, um, co-leading. Um, and he brings his own fan club with him. <laughs> a few things I know about Jordan, he has a passion for God's word and helping people um, just pointing to some of the, the good riches in God's word. If you don't believe me, be his friend on Facebook. It's, he's got like series of sermons written there that he has yet to give, but you know. Um, <laughs> as well, there was something else I was going to say and I just totally lost my train of thought. Oh, I also learned recently that this is not Jordan's first time preaching. While he was a student up at Clarkson, he was able to preach at his church in Potsdam. So he's old hat at this. So um, let me pray for Jordan and for us. Heavenly Father, I give thanks for Jordan, for the insight you give him, for his passion for you and your word. Um, Father, give him confidence for the message that you've given him and give us ears to hear. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. And that's quite a generous introduction. So thank you. <laughs> Um, and you will learn a little bit more about me uh, in this message, I, I do believe. So um, if you were to ask me, you know, Jordan, what is the topic in faith that you're most passionate about, I would be very quick to answer that it's the transformative power of worship. This idea that we actually become like what we worship, and this can be for better or for worse, depending on what you're worshiping. Um, but today we're just going to focus on the better. Um, and so I once thought that worship referred solely to just singing songs to God. And only in the last few years have I uncovered the true meaning of worship, and in doing so just kind of become obsessed with worship. And so this word worship actually comes from worth-ship. And so to worship is to attribute worth to some object. So our worship of Jesus is our attribution of worth to him. And so the great thing about this is that we can actually live every minute of our lives in worship of Christ. That we can live in such a way that every word we speak and everything we do actually attributes worth to Christ. And the even better part about this is that we're being transformed more and more into the glorious image of Christ as we worship him daily. And so today we're going to look at one facet of transformative worship that Paul described in his second letter to the Corinthians. And that is, unveiled worship of Jesus Christ by contemplating his glory. And so this is the statement that we get to unpack this morning. Uh, and so I invite you to stand now for the reading of God's word. And this comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And it says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. So before arriving at this concluding statement, Paul had actually been comparing uh, the old and new covenants. And so he'd actually been comparing the nature of the glory associated with the, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant referring simply to the Old Testament law and the New Covenant re referring to what we are familiar with as the good news in Jesus Christ. And so the word, the word glory, which is my second favorite Hebrew word right now, which is kavod, um, it means, literally means heaviness or weightiness. 
And so it's related to the significance of an object or person. And so when somebody important walks into a room, something about the environment changes. So like 10 years ago, this would have been if like Tiger Woods walked into the room and I was there and I would just like feel his presence. Like there would be some heaviness that comes upon me because of his significance to me. And so that heaviness, that weightiness is his glory. Now, in the Bible, glory is often manifested as light. And this was the case in Exodus 34, which is the passage that Paul had in mind when he was um, making, uh, well, when he was actually describing the nature of the glory of the Old Covenant. And so the Israelites had been at the foot of Mount Sinai, and Moses, at this point in chapter 34, had already been up and down Mount Sinai once in the 40-day, 40 40-night 40 thing and came down to find the Israelites worshiping a golden calf. So naturally, he threw the tablets on the ground and uh, had to go do this all over again for 40 more days and 40 nights. Um, but this time, when he came back down, when the Israelites saw him, they were, they were afraid. And they were afraid because his face was radiating. His face was, like, his face was glowing. It was radiating the glory of God. And so I think I would be pretty afraid if somebody's face was just mysteriously glowing. So it was difficult for Moses to actually uh, speak to them, but eventually he was able to uh, give them the law that he needed to give them. And so when he finished speaking with them, he actually put a veil over his face. And so at first, uh, it appears that Moses put the veil over his face because the Israelites were afraid. But what Paul has done in this passage that we're looking at today is explain that the real reason for Moses putting the veil over his face was to hide the transitory nature of the glory of the Old Covenant. And so the glory of the Old Covenant was fading. Its significance was not going to last and so Moses continued to, to receive commands from the Lord in the tent of meeting. Um, and whenever he did this, he removed the veil. And when he came back out, he would tell the Israelites what he had been commanded, with his face still radiant, only to put the veil back over his face until he went to speak uh, with the Lord again. And so the Israelites only saw Moses' face immediately after he left the presence of the Lord with new commands. And so as time passed between uh, these meetings with the Lord, the glory radiating from Moses' face actually faded. But the Israelites had no idea that this was happening because Moses had a veil hiding this fact from them. And so we see here that the nature of the glory radiating from Moses' face was transitory and that um, was the same as the nature of the glory of the old covenant, um, of the covenant law being given through Moses, that it was transitory, it was fading, and its significance was not going to last. So I have a desk lamp, which is one of those that you, you know, has the like 360 bendable neck thing going on, um, and it's on my nightstand because I am a grad student who can't afford a real lamp, and so. Uh, <laughs> On top of it, uh, kind of like a lampshade, I have a golf hat that I sponge painted with glow-in-the-dark paint. Now, on Thursday night, I did not remember why I had painted it, but I, I have now remembered, and it makes some sense. Um, so, if I were to remove the hat um, and move to a dark room after the lamp has been on, the colors will glow. But that glow fades, and before long, the hat is no longer glowing. So the hat is like the glory of the Old Covenant. And what we see in this is that it's the, it was the presence of God that caused Moses to glow with God's glory. Right? Once Moses left the presence of God, um, the glowing began to fade. And so in the case of the hat, it was the light of the lamp that caused the hat to glow. And so once the hat left the presence of the light, the glowing began, began to fade. And so we see that the glory fades when it is apart from the source of glory. So that either being the presence of God or the presence of light. But the new covenant, the good news of Jesus Christ, came with a glory 
that lasted. And so this is a glory that lasts because, as Paul said in Ephesians, it, it comes with a seal, which is the promised Holy Spirit. And so the, the presence of God fills those who have believed the good news of the new covenant, and it doesn't depart. Right? The, the lamp itself, the source of glory itself, has entered believers so that we may actually radiate the glory of God at all times. And so believers don't need to enter a tent of meeting to be in the presence of God, but the presence of God uh, is dwelling in believers through the Holy Spirit. And this is why the glory of the, the new covenant was lasting, unlike the glory of the old. And so all of these ideas and, and more led Paul to our text for this morning, which says, you know, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And so here, Paul actually presents a condition to being transformed into the image of Christ by our worship of him. And so this condition is the unveiled face. And we all who with unveiled faces are being transformed. But notice that if this condition is true, there's a fact that goes along with it, that anyone with an unveiled face is being transformed. Right? And we all who with unveiled faces are being transformed. So if you have an unveiled face, then you are being transformed into the image of Christ. And so how does our face become unveiled? And so in this same passage in verse 14, uh, Paul wrote, in, in Christ the veil is taken away. And in verse 16, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So only when we turn to Christ is our face unveiled. And such an unveiled face is necessary for true worship. And true worship is necessary for transformative worship. And so first, to have an unveiled face requires that we have turned to Christ, that we have fallen in love with Christ, that we desire his rule in our lives, that we want to be obedient to him in all we do. And so if we have turned to Christ, then our face is unveiled and true worship is possible. Uh, second, that those with unveiled faces have received the promised Holy Spirit. And true worship apart from, uh, true worship of Christ apart from the Holy Spirit is impossible. And so in the Gospel of John, uh, we see that God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And so the Holy Spirit helps us in our worship by actually energizing our spirit. And so it's necessary for true worship that the heart is turned to Christ, the heart is filled with the Holy Spirit, and thus we have an unveiled face. But we also see that an unveiled face is associated with the presence of God. Right? When Moses uh, went before the Lord to receive uh, the law, he unveiled his face. So when he was in the presence of God, he unveiled his face. And when he left, his face radiated the glory of God. So something about his existence changed because of his unveiled face in the presence of God. And so an unveiled face is necessary for being transformed by our true worship. Right? Whenever someone enters the presence of God with an open heart, a heart devoted to Christ, a heart that's willing to change, he or she cannot leave the same person. That is what the glory of God, the, the heaviness or weightiness of God does to us. It compels us to change. And so we see that whenever anyone went before Jesus with an open heart, he or she actually left his presence either healed or ready to radically change his or her way of life. And we as believers have the presence of God dwelling in us already. And so unveiled worship is true worship that is aided by the Holy Spirit, and it's this unveiled worship that transforms us. But how does this transformation take place? 
So again, we see, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image. And so the transformation into the image of Christ comes from contemplation of his glory. But how is this contemplation worship? And, and what does it look like actually contemplating the Lord's glory? And so to contemplate is to look thoughtfully at. And so I have recently been through a, a series and still kind of in the middle of making some important life decisions. And so in this process, I've been contemplating the pros and cons, the short and long-term consequences of the different options that I have. And so I've spent a good amount of time uh, thinking and, and working through the potential outcomes of each option. And so by contemplating, by looking thoughtfully at each option, I am attributing worth to the decision that I'm making. Right? I'm attributing worth to my life and my future and I believe that, you know, Jesus is attributing worth to my life, and so I ought to attribute worth to my life in these decisions. And so in that way, I believe I'm worshiping him. Um, but in the same way, we contemplate the glory of Jesus um, when we attribute worth to him. When we contemplate his glory, we are attributing worth to him and therefore worshiping him. So what does this really look like? Um, so... There's this story called The Great Stone Face written by Nathaniel Hawthorne, which I've never read. And so I am <laughs> quoting, I'm paraphrasing a guy who quoted a guy and, you know, it's all good. Um, so <laughs> in, in this story, he tells of this boy who lived in a village by a mountain. And on the mountainside, there was this great stone face that looked down upon the people in the village. And so there's this legend that someday someone was coming to that village who would look just like the great stone face. Somebody who would do, uh, do wonderful things for the village and would be the means of great blessing. And so this boy was gripped by this legend and hour after hour he would slip away and just go and look at the great stone face and think about the story of the one who was coming. And so the boy grew up and still that person that he was waiting for didn't come, but he still went to sit and contemplate the majesty and beauty of this great stone face. And so, you know, he continued to age, and finally he was an old man, and as he walked through the village, someone looked at him and exclaimed, he has come, the one who looks like the great stone face, the one who is like the great stone face. And so what did this boy do that caused him to look like the great stone face? Right? He slipped away hour after hour to gaze upon the great stone face. Right? He contemplated the majesty and beauty of the great stone face. And by contemplating it, he became like it. By contemplating, he became like what he contemplated. Right? So he became like what he worshipped. And so contemplation is not just like a blank stare. It's not an emptying of the mind. Um, but it's actually a filling of the mind with thoughts. It's a filling of the mind with focused wonder. And so imagine that you are watching paint dry. It's fun, isn't it? But instead of letting your mind wander, which should happen if you're... <laughs> you decide that you're going to just ponder the paint. You're going to ponder the color of the paint, the, the meaning of the paint. You know, what's making the paint dry, and where did this paint come from? And so everything that you think about as you gaze at this freshly painted wall is related to the paint itself. And so in the same way, we can fill our minds with thoughts about Jesus Christ, pondering just how good, just how gracious, just how worthy of our true worship he truly is. And the more that we do this, the more we'll be conformed to his image. And so kind of a, a subcategory of my, my great passion of transformative worship is um, engaging with God through um, Scripture. And so um, I think it's fun to think about the Bible as a crockpot. Um, and this is serious. <laughs> um, so when, when the, the crockpot is this slow cooker uh, and you put the meat in it, um, and you let it linger in the juices so that all of those good juices get absorbed into the meat. 
And so we're kind of like the meat, and the Holy Spirit is actually kind of like the juices. So when we open the Bible, um, we, we are in the presence of God because those words are filled with God's Spirit. And by just opening the Bible, reading it, contemplating it, we are allowing the Holy Spirit to uh, just absorb into us. So we are absorbing those good juices that are in Scripture. Um, and so... As Nikki mentioned, I might have a bunch of sermons that I've never preached. And um, last summer, last summer, I spent four, well, I spent one month, one month, writing four sermons on the 25-verse epistle called Philemon. Um, And I almost had the whole epistle memorized by the end of it all. Um, And so even today, I'm still affected. I still remember everything from Philemon. Um, and the way that contemplating that scripture impacted me. And so the, the final thought I want to leave you with is, is we we're also singing these words, that the earth is full of the glory of God. And so everywhere we go, the glory of God is there. And so we can fill our minds with thoughts of Jesus Christ everywhere. We can ponder the glorious attributes of Christ, the significance of who he is, what he has done, and, and what has yet to come, uh, which make him fully worthy of our worship. And in doing so, we will become more conformed to his glorious image. For we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, for your spirit, for your desire to change us and make us like Christ. God, we thank you that you have sought us out and just want us to bask in your love and grace daily. And so, God, I ask that you would continue this transforming work in us as we worship you with unveiled faces daily. And so, God, I ask that you would help us by your spirit to live this out. In Jesus' name, amen.